what's fascinating is to bring um, our attention to our direct experience, like um, Candice was talking about in the video. And um, to come to know uh, what is it that's fundamental about our experience in every moment that we um, care to check. And so one way that's um, helpful to be able to do that is to just stop thinking for a short moment. And again, like I said at the beginning, we'll come here with all sorts of different perspectives and ideas. Um, and often, if somebody tells you to stop thinking for a short moment, maybe that's even the moment when you think more than ever before, because you're, you're thinking about trying to stop thinking and different things like that. But um, nevertheless, all that's completely fine. When we stop thinking for a short moment, whether or not we can do that right now is, is OK, <laughs> either way. Um, what we nevertheless notice is that there is a alert, an alert cognizance. Um, there is the readiness to know. And that alert, cognizant intelligence that is the basis of everything we're experiencing right now is the reason why we can experience anything right now um, is always present. <laughs> so um, you can't turn it off. Um, so it's, it's nice in a way to, to kind of imagine that we're all here and we're all about three years old and this is our first day at school because this is like the most basic thing to learn, I think. The most simple, easy to understand, easy to check in our own experience. And, um, you know, I think it should become, come before any other form of education um, because it seems... Um, seems important that we would know directly in our own experience what our own nature is. And so this simple recognition of the nature of mind or the nature of open intelligence, which is what we usually call it, this cognizant alertness is synonymous with an open intelligence that cannot be switched off. Um, It seems that this would be like the most uh, fundamental thing to to be pointed out to us, and um, it's kind of um, peculiar, really, that uh, for the most part, most people never have this pointed out to them. And even having had it pointed out, it may seem like, what does it really have to do with my life and the quality of my life and uh, with my aspirations to? you know, be comfortable, to have everything I need, to provide for other people, to be of service in the world. And um, if we uh, take short moments to recognize the nature of mind or recognize open intelligence uh, repeatedly whenever we naturally remember and gain assurance in this always present nature of open intelligence, what we increasingly realize for ourselves, not because somebody has described it to us, not because we have believed somebody who's told us, but we gain assurance in our own experience of the fact that our mind is innately stable. So just like a mirror remains open, remains brilliant, remains lucid, remains free of blemishes, regardless of what reflections appear within it, so too does our mind remain brilliant, lucid, and free of blemishes, regardless of what appearances, regardless of what content, regardless of what data appears within it. So this is... Um,
a um, revolutionary thing to come to see in ourselves. Because it means that all of the effort we've been making to control our data, to control our thoughts and emotions, we come to see was always completely unnecessary. And most of us, through having not been um, supported in coming to know the nature of our mind, have spent an incredible amount of effort to try to hold certain emotions at bay and to try to hold certain other emotions, emotions in place or hold certain thoughts at bay and hold certain other thoughts in place. And this extraordinary amount of effort that we've made to do that and the lack of knowledge that it's not necessary to do that is the nature of suffering. This is what suffering is. It's the misunderstanding that it's necessary to control our mind. And it keeps us busy endlessly because our mind is always, it's like a fountain, an uncontrollable, wild fountain of experience, sensations, thoughts, emotions, visual perceptions, uh, audible perceptions, and I think that covers everything. <laughs> if anybody finds anything else in their experience, I'd be, I'd be interested to know. Actually, that's an interesting thing to um, taste. Uh, so to me, that goes in the category of sensation. I like, to ke I like to reduce it, keep it simple. It is interesting that you can't find anything except for visual, audible, and sensation experiences. There is nothing else. <laughs> and of course the fact that they are there um, automatically entails the fact that there is alert cognizance pervading all of them. So it's actually very simple. Our nature is very simple. And um, it's vitally important for us as individuals and as a global community um, firstly to be introduced to this and to have quality support available uh, to, to become assured of it. And again, assurance only, only comes about through direct experience, not through, um, not through having to believe anything. So nobody has to believe anything I say or anybody says. You can give full respect to your direct experience put everything you've learned aside and take a short moment whenever you naturally remember to check what is the nature of my direct experience and you will always find that there is this open alert intelligence which pervades all experience and there's nothing we can do about it the nature of our mind is stable that's just the way it is the nature of the mirror in relation to its reflections is stable. So just imagine if the mirror didn't know that and it thought it needed to do something about everything that appears within it. It would be constantly busy, constantly worried. Oh no, is that, is that uh, red, red color going to appear again soon? Thank God the red color's not here at the moment. Oh no, the red color's back because somebody walks past with a red jumper on. <laughs> Oh, I failed again. I'm a failure. I'm a bad person. Um, it would, like, <laughs> it's com just completely bizarre for a mirror to think that. And it's not any less bizarre for us to have these misunderstandings about ourselves. It only seems not bizarre because it's normal. But it is bizarre. It's completely bizarre and weird. <laughs> so, um, so balanced view is um, uh, a solution to this fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is um, a lack of having been introduced to the nature of mind, generally speaking, in the world, 
and a lack of opportunity to have full support to gain assurance in that uh, in order to fully potentiate each individual's ability to contribute to society in a beneficial way. And so, in Balanced View, um, we, have, we call this support system the Four Mainstays, and it consists of um, the opportunity of a teacher. So, um, for example, here at the open meeting, you, you can ask, and this open meeting happens every week, you can ask any questions that you have about how to, um, how to apply the practice and how to best benefit from uh, the practice and the support. Um, there's the teaching. Um, and we have many um, uh, teaching settings that are offered. Actually, um, there might be one next Sunday. We can... Uh, we're, we haven't confirmed that yet. <laughs> um, so there's the simple teaching and um, teacher teaching practice of short moments repeated many times and then the community. Uh, so it's very helpful to, to have a community of people who share, um, who share your aspiration uh, to come to know your identity exactly as it is and your direct experience. So, um, like I said, regardless of what we're thinking and what ideas we have, we might think that everything I've said is utter rubbish. We might think everything I've said is, is really wonderful. Uh, we might feel uncomfortable here. We might feel comfortable here. We might uh, feel skeptical. We may feel whatever the opposite of skeptical is. Um, and the cool thing is that it, it, it's completely irrelevant. You can like it, you can dislike it, you can be compelled to constantly try to refute it in your mind, and it's completely fine. Uh, it's, it's irrelevant. Every time you check, open intelligence will be evidently the basis of everything you're experiencing. So, coming here, people aren't even asked to agree or like what's being said. Uh, it's completely uninteresting to me uh, to request that of anybody. What's important to me is that everybody takes a moment, whenever they naturally remember, to recognize that the basis of whatever they're feeling and thinking or perceiving is open intelligence. Because the relief that comes from that, over time, changes our life beyond recognition. First, it, it feels like a relief. It's a relief to know, at least for a short moment, that we don't have to do anything. <laughs> um, and really, if you think about it, why would we think we would need to anyway? If we've come here, Let's just take this setting. We've come here to sit down for an hour. What is it that we thought we needed to do? There's nothing that we need to do. Our mind takes care of everything. Our mind has all of its experiences without us having to do anything. And our mind remains stable, brilliant, lucid, unblemished, without us having to do anything. The mirror doesn't have to make any effort to be free from uh, the suffering of thinking that something needs to be done about all of its appearances. So first, at least we uh, experience a clear sense of relief that we can completely relax in that short moment that we recognize open intelligence. We can completely relax. We don't have to hold it all together anymore. We can let go of the reins and let nature take care of everything. Nature is another synonym of mind. Uh, we are nothing other than nature itself. We are inseparable from the entirety of nature itself. 
so as as this relief becomes more and more um, evident in our experience, uh, and this tremendous investment we've been making in needing to avoid, replace, or indulge our thoughts and emotions settles down, we find that we um, have a lot more time, we have a lot more energy. It's the time and energy we were using to, to constantly need to keep certain things at bay and to try to keep certain other things uh, in place. It's like um, uh, watching a fireworks display and our favourite firework is the green one and our least favourite one is the blue one and then getting disappointed every time there's a blue one and, and also disappointed every time the green one um, resolves. Um, it's just utter madness. <laughs> um, so we find we have more time and more energy uh, because we've given up this ridiculous task that was always unnecessary. And um, we find that we, being unafraid of ourselves, which is an, a new thing for us, suddenly we're unafraid of ourselves. We find that everything we experience uh, actually is just different aspects of our beneficial potency. Everything is, everything we experience is our tremendous power to be of benefit to all. And so beyond this relief uh, that we first experience in short moments, uh, the beneficial results of this teaching are Far, they're scaled far more greatly than that. We find that uh, we can support people in our lives when they come to us for support in a much, much more profound way than we were ever, ever able to before, purely because we're not afraid of ourselves anymore. We're not afraid of the uh, spontaneous display of our own minds. not afraid of it, and also increasingly assured that all of it, like I said, is our beneficial potency. And um, everything that we deeply want is contained in our mind. This is like utter, complete relaxation to see this. When this becomes clear, it's like somebody has lifted the weight off our backs. And it can be clear in each short moment. So it's not like some special destination to try to arrive at. It's always already the case. But we can only enjoy it if we know that that's how it is. Like, you can only enjoy the benefits of having a £50 note in your pocket if you know that it's there. Otherwise, you can't buy 50 brownies at the end of the, of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> but if somebody points out to you, you have £50 in your pocket, and these are the benefits of having £50. <laughs> this is how to use it. Then you can do all sorts of different awesome things with it. <laughs> So you already have 50 pounds in your pocket. <laughs> but effectively, you don't unless you know about it. So it's the same with open intelligence. So something that, that I see in myself and also other people from the community is that increasingly, um, as the beneficial nature of ourselves becomes more evident to us. Uh, directly proportional to that is our recognition of the beneficial potency of everybody. So <coughs> uh, 
irrespective of what people are involved with, what practices they're employing, what they say. <laughs> if somebody's completely, you know, just lost their temper or <coughs> completely um, at the whim of this emotion or that emotion, um, what first and foremost uh, we see in people is their beneficial potency, irrespective of whether it's clear to them or not. And um, so, yeah, I find that I'm uh, not particularly interested in um, necessarily the different categories that people could fall into, or what they're doing, or whether it's the same as what I'm doing, or whether they're from a similar or different culture. Um, it's just kind of secondary uh, to the fact that um, their obvious nature is beneficial potency. And so increasingly that is the level upon which we relate to people. That is what we um, recognize and uphold and respect in people. And um, it's magical to see that when we do that, often people naturally assume their beneficial potency purely because somebody recognizes and respects it in them. They don't have to make any sort of display in order to show themselves to be respect worthy. Um, there is no category that anybody needs to fall into in order to be worthy of respect. You don't have to be from this country or that country, or from this race or that race, this gender or that gender. Simply by virtue of the fact that you exist, you command respect. And um, when somebody relates to you with that respect, or the other way around, uh, we often find that people can naturally and immediately relax into that, can instinctively embody that uh, powerful, potent, and beneficial identity that on some level everybody knows that's the way it is. That, that sounds airy-fairy, but that's, yes, everybody on some level knows that that's the way it is. And that's why there's such a palaver made of trying to be a certain way. There's a constant um, wishing for people to recognize this in us, to support us in this. And um, when it isn't consistently there, we often assume, well, I must be having the wrong thoughts and emotions then. Therefore, I have to perform all sorts of acrobatics with my personality in order to get people to like me, etc., etc. But in balanced view, this support is there. This support is available for all of us. Whereby uh, this profound identity, which on some level all of us know we have, is recognized and respected. And we are uh, supported uh, in every way to the extent that we ourselves take uh, advantage of that support to become assured of it. So, um, with your uh, question, Ollie, I, I totally understand your question, I, and I have had the same question um, about myself as well, uh, because I really, really love humor, and um, often find that accidentally I prioritize that above everything else. <laughs> and uh, it's just... Um, I don't have any self-blame associated with that. I recognize that it happens. And for the 99% of the time, it's perfectly in, in alignment with uh, respectful relating. But then 1% of the time, it isn't. So that's great. And that 1% gets smaller over, over, over time. And I enjoy myself more as well. So it's not that we need to... to put some kind of contrived injunction on the way we are. That's the opposite of what we need to do. We need to completely relax and enjoy life. And naturally, we will respect other people without having to 
demand it of ourselves. The respect is natural. We just love everybody the more we allow ourselves to be as we are.